This is Awareness Explorers. Welcome back, Awareness Explorers. It's good to have you. I love having a tribe. Hopefully you feel the tribeness of our, our gatherings. I'm Jonathan Robinson. I'm with my co-host, Brian Tom O'Connor. And we have a special guest today, Jack O'Keefe, who many of you probably know. Uh, I've watched her lectures and heard her reputation for a long time. But before we introduce Jack, um, anything you want to say, Brian? Well, I'm very excited about this because I, I had read uh, Jack's first book, Born to be Free, quite a while ago and loved it. And then was very excited about uh, her new book, How to Be a Spiritual Rebel. Mm, I like that title. <laughs> well, so let me do a little bio about Jack. Jack O'Keefe experienced a spontaneous awakening in 1997. This gave her access to powerful, intuitive, and healing capacities and influenced her change in career. She's worked closely with a team of medical doctors researching the spiritual causes underpinning clinical depression. In 2003, she left Ireland to deepen her spiritual practice. O'Keefe began to work as a spiritual teacher in 2008, and now she guides others in her teachings and publications in order to share what she has learned and assists others to transcend both dual and non-dual perspectives. She also prepares those who have had sustained spiritual awakenings for ultimate liberation. Well, welcome to Awareness Explorers, Jack. Good to have you. Thank you guys for the opportunity to chat with you. You know, um, whenever I read that somebody had a spontaneous awakening, just to be perfectly honest, I get a little pissed off because I've been working at this for a long time, you know? And <laughs> I wonder what that's like, you know? You, you, one day you're, you're walking around and then you, you're, you're making meatloaf or whatever. And what, I mean, can you tell us what happened? Yeah. Um, really, the, that awakening was my third eye opening. And I notice mm -hmm. nowadays we tend to use the same word because your third eye opening, sure, it changes your lens of perception. But the spiritual awakening of like being enlightened or liberated is a much deeper thing, much later. Mm -hmm. And so spontaneous but when I look back the preparation was there because I went mm -hmm. into psychotherapy because psychotherapy at the time and I think it still is is a free service in university in Ireland mm -hmm. and so when I found that that was available I went every week so I had a few years of therapy and then I was in the groove by the time I graduated and continued on my own so by that time in my mid-20s I had a lot of tools on managing my mind on recognizing like what was my stuff where was I reacting? Where am I feeling free and open? So, so I had some skills around watching myself. That definitely helped. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition, I messed around with recreational drugs a lot. You know, that definitely loosened things too. I don't recommend it, but for my own story, it loosened things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You well, know, what did you notice changed for you when this event happened? There was a, a, a weekend away that myself and my husband at the time and two other couples, there were six of us, we were having lunch on a Sunday afternoon and I was having a can of Heineken, lifted up my head and there was dead people hanging from the ceiling. And I was, nobody else saw them. <laughs> and I knew I wasn't on anything, but I yeah. thought somebody's given me an acid tab. What's going on? This isn't funny. I'm seeing crazy shit. Wow. And and, um, you know, obviously it wasn't. And it was horrendous. Like, looking back, sure, it was a game changer. And my life shifted from there. I was 30. And looking back, the amount of fear that came up, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It's like, are you yeah. sure you want a spontaneous awakening? Do you want your world to turn upside down so that you don't know if you're dead or alive or what alive means or what we're doing here and if we're here i remember having thoughts around that year thinking these people make me these dead people make me so scared that if i killed myself i'd be one of them so i actually can't get out at all i can't mm. make it stop there is no escape at all i'm screwed i'm just spiraling forever that that's a lot of fear um and so all the therapy i had done didn't touch this kind of fear didn't 
had no words or tools in my mm. psyche. Nothing had been prepared for this type of thing. And so I had to go to healers and, and orient myself in a different direction to understand, okay, maybe my atheism needs to be cracked open a little bit because I'm not dreaming this. Yeah, yeah. So where do I start here? So it, it completely changed my life, you know? And I did feel that I had a choice to shut this down or let it completely and totally run amok with my life. And I thought about that a little bit. And while I was facing that question, a, a being appeared. I was like, oh my God, not another one. And he was full of light. Full of light, glowing. I found out that he's actually a, a guy who's a, a, a spiritual master, who's still alive. I found out who he was several years later. Anyway, this dude appears. And he's like, you really do have to choose. And I'm like, well, what's in it for me? Why the heck would I like let something like this take me over? I have no control. I, it, my belief system is upside down. A everything I thought I knew is wrong. Like, why would I go here? And he said, because of this. And mm -hmm. I got this feeling of unconditional love that knocked my socks off, mm -hmm. like blew my circuits. I'm like, oh my God, what's that? And he said, that's love. Mm -hmm. That's unconditional love. And I'm like, I I, I, I I missed it. I didn't know what it was. Can I have it again? And he said, okay, prepare yourself. I'm like, okay, okay. I was lying down. I'm like, okay. Okay, off you go. I'm ready. And I got this wave again. And I thought, okay, I'm not imagining this. I'm not initiating it. This is an experience that's been given in some way. Mm -hmm. and I'm, okay, I want more of that. And he said, my dear, that's a teaspoon. And there are <laughs> oceans of it. So mm. that's where this path will bring you. And it was a rough ride for many years, um, but but he was right. I'm so yeah. glad that he showed up, you know? That's a wild story. Oh, I have yeah. lots of them. I have lots of them. Like, it's been <laughs> wacky, like completely nuts. And only, only I'm a farmer's daughter and kind of grounded, you know? I would think I have had psychotic episodes, but I haven't. These are spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. This is how it happened for me, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would scare a lot of people. But um, I, I loved what you said that you had gone through a lot of therapy first, because, you know, that all, also happened to me. And what I realized, well, therapy was a safe place to have your emotions. And I, I discovered that depression, I mean, I was very depressed. And when I realized that it's not a separate emotion, but a strategy to not have emotions, then I started, then things started to sort of soften and clear up a lot more. Yeah. And then learning about non-duality and the fact, as you mentioned, unconditional love is not only our nature, but it's what everything is made of. Everything. I'm so glad you named it, Brian. I'm so glad because everything is born of it, imagines that it loses it, plays at finding it, it's all about love. Right. Even if we're in the crappiest, most broken place, this is an experience that's being held in love. Even if we can't find love at all, it's like love is the blanket that's around that experience. And it's not threatened by that experience. It's holding it. Right. So and well said. You know, I, I was looking, I mean, you obviously had to go through huge belief changes. And mm. a lot of people struggle with beliefs that are, limiting in some way what what helped you to change your belief system or what advice would you have for people who feel like they're struggling with some belief or or thought form that's holding them back for me it makes sense it did then and it does now that beliefs are are something to anchor into while they work but if mm -hmm. we're rigid with them, sooner or later, they'll make us suffer. Mm. They're, they're designed to be uh, stations along the road as we're traveling along the track to kind of like, try this out. How does this support? How does this work? Is this where I can fit in and find a code, a way to find people with similar beliefs or ways to express myself from the world? And it's like, Get back on the train again. Be prepared to leave that and move on. It's like 
beliefs are things we need to grow out of. So the amount of times I've believed something and then moved out of it. And, and that fluidity, I think, is very important. Yeah. Um, increasingly so as we spiritually evolve, because we, we end up kind of surrendering to the movement of love. We're surrendering to what wants to happen. There's no stickiness in that. You can't, you can't stick to the belief that it's all love. You get a eureka that everything is underpinned by love. It's like, a, oh, holy crap, I was there all the time. Now, if that becomes a belief, I believe I'm pure light. It's like, oh, watch that one break down. Oops. So it's like spirituality brings us to recognizing what is true. Don't turn it into a belief. Mm -hmm. So beliefs then are things that, you know, useful along the way, but invariably we have to outgrow them. All of them. All of yeah. them. Yeah. Right. Well, the word, the word belief systems, if you look at it, it's BS, you know, belief systems. Yeah, that's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I love it. Yes. I'm going to remember the, that. This is so much in keeping with um, what I noticed was the difference between your first and second book. I mean, your first book, Born to be Free, I read many years ago, and it was one of my favorite books. And it, it seemed to me to be a perfect communication of non-duality. But in your next book, How to Be a Spiritual Rebel, you use the traits and the habits of the false self as sort of a, a jumping off point, something to rebel against. Like, That's for right. instance, celebrating when you get to see a personality blind spot. Yes. Were there, was there a personal experience or an observation of you or your students that led you to zero in on, on how our individual stories keep us from realizing our true nature? That's a really interesting question, Brian. I think it has to do with my own growth, really, to, to answer that one. When I spent those few years in India, in the mid noughties as we call them in Ireland, the zero, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, in the noughties, in that decade, I, I reached a phase of where there were no thoughts, where my self-referential network in my brain, I, I felt it burn. Um, I, I had no nighttime dreams, no imaginings, no, there was nothing, no creativity, but there was perfect stillness. There was simply one present moment that was being lived through this form. Um, my family had a hard time with it. I remember my sister that I would be closest to was like, I've lost you. I don't know who you are. You're, you're not there. And friends of mine saying, I feel like I can put my hand through you. You're not <laughs> like, you're not there. I'm, you know, I mean, I, whatever, whatever kind of was my response. And in the, the spiritual gatherings that I was leading, nobody was getting it. And I was like, it's as clear as the nose in your head. Nobody's getting it. They keep coming back and they're full of pain. I'm like, okay, something is off here. I would have imagined that that hearing these words, which I was craving for, for like 10 years prior on my own journey, that if somebody had, had told me the truth of my true nature, it surely would have expedited the whole thing. Mm -hmm. What I'd forgotten was that I had done a lot of work and I had tools to manage my emotional body and my trauma body. And so I was like, oh, God, I'm going to have to somehow integrate where people are at. Not everybody is ready to leapfrog. Maybe that just happened to me and a few of us because we are being prepared to teach. Maybe so. What would it be like to wake up and still be rearing your kids and still be going to work in Walmart, wherever? And so, so I started to look at how, how does it work in an integrated way? And I knew for me to be able to teach something, I have to experience it. I, I, I just can't teach a concept unless I know it to be true myself. So I'm, I made a conscious decision. I'm going to have to go back into life. Mm. I'm going to have to make that leap. And so I knew, okay, that probably means more relationships back into maybe marriage. Maybe, I don't know what I'm going to have to do. Let's start with having a pint of Guinness and see. Let's let's actually introduce alcohol and see what happens there. I'm like, oh yeah, I see what that does to my nervous system, that does to my brain. And you know, let's go to some place really dense that I wouldn't dream of going. 
and see how that impacts me. So I slowly but surely reintegrated myself from a monastic, inward, quiet, simple lifestyle into the regular, raw life that most people live in. And so I learned a lot about the interface. How can you manage that interface between that stillness that was abiding and is still abiding in my system? There's always, a, 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 oh, I don't know, a, a glow, a shine, an awareness. Some part of my attention is always on the stillness inside. Mm -hmm. And then a chunk of my attention is out in the world. And I've been playing with that balance in myself like am I anywhere scared that if too much of me goes into the world that I'll actually lose access I'm like okay let's try it out let's try it out because I don't want to harbor the fear I don't want to be protective of this abiding awakening I want to know okay if that's the way it's going to play bring it on and so that internal process that was happening for me brought me to a place of where I need to write another book. And it's about how to be in relationship with uh, with, with our dysfunctional humanness. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with that? And how do we use that? Not, not to be um, something that needs to be killed or ashamed of, to feel guilty about, to hide, to only bring up in a therapeutic context because you want to be all glowing and nice on the outside. It's like, bring it all here. Bring it all here. Now, how does that look from a spiritual perspective? How does it play and how can we celebrate it and integrate it, learn from it, get wiser so that our awakening process can be real, authentic, with no hiding? So how to be spiritual rebel came out of that process within my own reintegration, embodiment, another word for the same thing, I suppose. Yeah, that's fascinating. I uh, was with a spiritual teacher for 26 years where the focus was on looking at your obstacles. Um, and I thought that was very valuable. The problem was that maybe there wasn't enough focus on the silence, you know, and trying to find those. We often use the analogy of two wings of a plane. There's the silence and then there's the the humanness. And trying to find that balance is hard for a lot of people. I'm wondering with your students that you have now, what role do you play or what do you do with them that you find is, is particularly helpful to them? Yeah. <clears throat> I had a private practice for through all the years and I closed it in about May this year because it stopped being fun. Financially a disastrous move, but that'll take care of itself somehow. Uh, like I, don't make decisions based on things like that. I have mm -hmm. to honor what wants to happen inside me. The private practice really taught me that darn everybody's path is different. The mm -hmm. level of inside and outside changes itself. Six months later, the amount of inner stillness versus the amount of working on your obstacles will change. It mm -hmm. constantly modifies. And I want to, in my online work now, now I just do group work. In that work, I, I'm challenged myself to find what is appropriate for each person. And can I speak for an hour to where I'm addressing both? That we're looking at an obstacle and we're dialing into a deeper level of perception. And mm -hmm. how do the two meet? And where, for each person, where am I most at home? And am I resting in the, on the still wing of the plane in order to avoid the obstacle of the other wing on the plane? Right. And am I all about the drama and so caught up in my trauma that I can't be still at all? So I will constantly look at the obstacles and imagine I'm on a spiritual path, but I'm not. I'm just swimming in my psychology. Yeah. So all these nuances and tricks are part of what I teach now so that each person has agency to be able to recognize what is it that 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 um is that it could be that could define my balance between the inner stillness and working on what's blocking my perception and i think the key if people get it most people seem to understand this key 
that where do I get caught in my own story and and I've forgotten the stillness? Mm -hmm. What is it that makes, brings in a veil, creates an eclipse between the, my true nature and life? And maybe I wake up and I'm stuck in life. And until, I, until something happens that reminds me of my inner stillness, I'm mostly in life. Perfect. Fine. If you know where you are, you can move from it. But if you're not able to be honest with where you are, you're just going to stay in that hiding place. And if you're 80% stuck in story and 20% of the time you get a little bit of, oh, I remember, it's just drama. I'm just caught in my own ideas here. Perfect. Fine. The more often that you can step out and go, oh, yeah, I was caught in my own story. It's like, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And making those little moments more frequent. Mm -hmm. Right. And and some of the uh, things that you suggest to sort of step out of your story are doing things that you, as you have defined yourself, might not do. Yes, that's right. That's right. Good point. So something you would never do for sure has a whole pyramid of beliefs and fears and stories and hidden unconscious, largely, biases and uh, triggers that your your ego self wants to stay away from that now. Don't touch this. You'd never do that. So don't go near it at all. And that's the very thing that will keep you in the hypnosis of your own drama. Right. So I tell people to push your edge, find your edge and push it, push it, push it, you know. That's interesting because my teacher used to, one of the main things that he would do is, is give me tasks that I would never do. You know, like I'm mechanically very poor. So I was in charge of all the cars of the community or um, I was brought up Jewish. So he told me to uh, explore Christianity for a year and all those things really loosened me up. You know, they were very helpful. It works, Jonathan, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 I love your statement. Uh, I wrote it down. Where do I get caught in my story and I lose my inner stillness? Uh, that could be like a mantra throughout your day of just seeing yes. where those places are. Yes, where those places are. And the amount of repetition. The same places get us caught again and again. Yeah. which is a signal, all right, all right, come on, get bored with yourself, get bored with yourself and, and break it down because you're you're kind of being a robot now, just going through the same motions. Mm -hmm. Where do you get caught? You know, moms often get caught with the kids. That's usually the last one to break. You know, there's, there's certain patterns that I've noticed. Yeah. So what do you do when you find a pattern? Like, uh, for example, a, a trigger for me is when I face uh, extreme incompetence like in a business or something like that. It just really triggers me. And so, you know, I, I know the pattern, uh, you know, yeah. I'm calling the airline and they hang up three times and then they get yes. me on the wrong flight and then they don't send the email. You know, what do you do when you find a pattern like that? Yes. Depends on what lens of perception you have access to. So Jonathan, if you're, if, if you have access to recognizing that that Jack is you in another form, that Brian is you in another form, then the incompetent, ditzy, not trained, not interested in their job person who's on the helpline of the airline and really hasn't interest in responding to you, but they're just clocking in the hours. Yeah. That is me. Mm. That mm. is me in another form. Right. What I am is enabling that to happen. What I am is allowing me to have that experience to be pissed off about mm -hmm. that person. And it's also enabling that ditzy person to be incompetent. Consciousness has no problem at all with all of this. <laughs> right. oh, where, where's the problem arising? Where's that little stone in my shoe that I'm making an issue with this? Right. Mm -hmm. And when we sit with... What I am has no problem with this. Okay, where does it move from? I actually have no problem with this. And if I shift my lens of perception, where can I find, oops, yes, at, there's the line inside myself of where it becomes an issue. You'll find, I believe that, you know, I should be treated better. Okay, where did I learn that? 
I believe mm. that people should be trained adequately, adequately. Sure, that's a value system that's in society. Sure. However, it doesn't happen quite a lot. Where did you believe that? Where did you gain the idea and turn it into a belief that it should be so, that people are trained in their jobs? So dialing then into all, all the layers that have given rise to this um, contraction of it shouldn't be so. There should be more competency in whoever is at the help desk in the airline. Mm -hmm. And it unravels it and it becomes kind of funny. It's like, wow, look at all those beliefs clumped together that make me suffer. Right. And it also seems that when you said that consciousness has no problem with that, that's that's the reason that it is unconditional love. Yes. Yes. There's also some another concept that two concepts that I found really fascinating in how to be a spiritual rebel in your chapter. Uh, it's not you, it's your brain. You talk about the default mode network or D mm -hmm. DMN. That's and right. it's also referred to the, re, you refer to it, I think, as the uh, self-referencing network, whose primary right. task is to establish a sense of personal self. That's right. So how does the DMN or the default mode network build a personal identity and, and how do you break free of it? Yeah. Breaking free of it. Mine broke down. So I was kind of incompetent for a while. You know, mine actually kind of fried because I stopped using it. But I was in a, you know, I was in India. I was in a lot of silence. My, when it, after it broke, I didn't, I wasn't able to see myself. You see, my sense of personal eye was gone. But my body got up and saw my passport beside my bed. My body got up and walked to the mirror and looked at Jacqueline O'Keefe, March the 3rd, 1967, okay? And my eye went up to the mirror and my eye went down to the passport photograph. And after a minute or two, it would click like, oh, okay, okay. And so I could feel the concept of time coming in. I could feel, so what date is today? So what age am I? And these, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. These these pieces of building myself had to be manually done, but consciousness was doing them because I wasn't there to kind of say I need to do this. I mean, there was no personal eye. Now, I do not advocate that for anybody. It doesn't need to happen. We didn't have any information at the time about that default mode network. The self-referencing network is really useful. And we we teach our children, you know, how to your name is Tom and this is your sister and give that to your sister, Mary. And so we have ways of labeling, okay, I'm here, this is my boundary and Mary's another person and that's my sister. And I have to give this object, which isn't me there. And so this wiring happens in our childhood. The trouble is we believe the darn thing. We believe that I am that person mm -hmm. and that Mary is that person. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. We believe it hook, line and sinker because we don't have the capacity yet to bring spirituality into into our schools. It's only just becoming mainstream thanks to the Internet. You know, mm -hmm. it was like the preserve of monastic and spiritual lives or hermits or shepherds or people who disconnected. And now we're learning how to integrate it. We're not at the place yet of how do we rear our children and how do we educate people to be able to see that my sense of self is related to my body mind mechanism and that's not who I am. However, I'm responsible for my sense of self. So, so I can totally uh, cultivate and nurture and improve on my personal self. That's what we do with psychology and personal development. We improve that personal eye so that it doesn't have so many pain triggers. It can be there. It's just not who you are. It's right. just not who you are. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have a counterpart to, to, to that that you also talk about, the um, task-oriented network, or, or TON, mm -hmm. which, which fire sig you say that it fires signals that enable you to do what you need to do, but it can work without making it personal. That's right. That's so you right. can do stuff in life without okay. the story of me. That's right. That's right. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That so so the freedom then of doing something and not looking for praise, not needing validation, not needing to recognize it. It's mm -hmm. beautiful, no? And like 
spiritual service is like that. It's selfless. So we have ways of training ourselves to do tasks where we're not making it all about me. And at the same time, in order to have a healthy sense of self, there needs to be self-love. Because if if we don't balance it, it's like the two wings of the plane here again, you know, mm -hmm. in another stage of our spiritual growth. Can we can we make sure that I'm not being a victim when I'm doing selfless service, when I'm doing when I'm operating without me, myself, I and I'm doing tasks? Am I still OK? Does self-care feature in there? Am I taking care of my health? Is there compassion and love for myself? Mm -hmm. You know, and and I think a lot of spiritual traditions denied that. That that we we have to take responsibility for ourselves. What happens there if we don't take responsibility and love ourselves totally? Without that being in place and a denial of our body mind mechanism, what happens is our personal needs get projected onto others, mm -hmm. onto our students. And then we have bad practice then we have manipulation, then we have cults, mm -hmm. you see? So isn't it subtle, all the layers of, of how the landscape changes as we evolve on our spiritual path? Yeah, yeah. You know, you uh, mentioned that you uh, had all this silence and was separate from the world, and then you re-entered the world. And I've talked to some uh, awake people who have had similar experiences, and they say that um getting back into the world of relationships and especially it was quite challenging i'm wondering what that was like for you yeah you know, on one, one side of you is is a totally liberated person the other side is now dealing with this new thing was that challenging very challenging until i discovered that i i really need to stay very present to myself and not judge where somebody else is at. Mm -hmm. Because um, spiritual hubris can very easily develop where there is that arrogance of, oh, you're just stuck in story. <laughs> that happens a fair bit out there, doesn't it? That happens a fair bit. Yeah. And and if if we do have an embodied um, sense of the unified consciousness. There is compassion for yourself showing up in everybody. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's it's about, and, and that it was turbulent until I kind of like, oh, that that's how I can manage being in the world in a balanced way. Noticing that what I am is everybody, what I am is this person, and my personality might really have a problem with that person. And my deeper self knows that I am that too. Mm. So when there is conflict, small or large, how can I creatively work with that energy of conflict? I'm curious. What can I do with conflict? Sometimes I walk away because I'm like, I, I, there's no movement there. There's no, I can't find a resolution. It's rare, but I can do it. I can, I got to move away from that because I'm taking care of myself. And every case is different. Like, the amount of self-honesty that I've had to cultivate with myself and that that self-honesty has to continue to grow and develop mm. so that I'm able to, as best as I can, be willing to say yes to every challenge in a relationship. And if I need to go to a mediator, if myself and my husband need to go to a couples therapist, I'm all for it. I'm all for every support to help me see and understand how is my personality functioning here? What is it in my personality that I'm not recognizing um, that that might be some latent pattern? Is this a situation I have to walk away from? Is that what really wants to happen? Or is there something hidden in my unconscious that I'm obeying by walking away? I mm. want to heal and open every part of me that, that is resistant to the love that is all of us. And so that's really tricky, you know? That's really tricky. I, I remember talking to um, a, a, a very well-known spiritual teacher at a conference a couple of years ago. 
And he said, no, I never join, become a member of anything. I don't want to become a member of anything because in school, there were all these clubs and groups and I was bullied. And my response is like, mm, I want to heal that. That's what I would do. <laughs> right, right. And he said, no, I, I need to preserve him and love him and let him have his way and honor him and his choice not to join any group. And I'll stay solo. I'm like, okay, my way is different. I'm like, let's, let's get in there and discover that part of my personality and open it. But not everybody is wired in that way. But that's how I see spirituality. It's about being as saying yes to all of it. It's about being as open and clear and um, honest as I can be right now. Inclusive I, as I can be right now. Inclusive. Yeah, that's a great word. But maybe that that person, I mean, I can relate to it. Maybe yeah. he is included by loving and accepting that part of him that doesn't want to and not saying this is something wrong with me that I need to fix. Maybe right. he is being open to it. That's right. He is being open to it. I'm different. Yeah. Yeah. He 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 wants to love that and spend more time with it. Right. With, with that part of himself that feels broken and isolated. And so like it's not that one is right as one is wrong. It's that I I have to honor the way I'm wired and he honors the way he is wired. Right. You but see? the similarity in both of you is that you're breaking down the you're not saying this is wrong. This is bad. This is something that I will exclude from my experience. Yes. And that's something that your way and his way have in common. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And being willing and open to share our differences. Yeah. And neither of us judged each other. We just found it interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. You know, it's like, okay, these are two very different approaches and, and they both happen in consciousness, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I love the attitudes and the wisdom you're, you're describing. I'm wondering if you ever suggest specific techniques or use any specific techniques for yourself? Gosh. Gosh. I often say, take things for a walk. Hmm. Literally. I'm like, okay. There's uh, something feels uncomfortable there. I dial into my body mm -hmm. and then I have to take that for a walk, which means don't analyze it, Jack, be with it. Let it be here and see what wants to happen. Mm. So by going for a walk, I'm in nature. I have fresh air and, and I'm letting some uncomfortableness be present. I don't want to fix it. I want to witness it and say yes and see what happens. And from there, some what to me is wisdom will come forward. It will come forward. I love that. I've never heard that specific thing before. And yeah, I can see how valuable it would be. You know, it's a way to maybe not just get lost in an, uh, a thought loop, but bring it into your body, get some movement going and then yes. listen deeper. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, that's what I do. Uh -huh. That's what I do. My body plays much more of a role now than it ever did. Um, because I, my approach would have been very much oriented by therapy early on. So watch your mind, watch your mind, watch your mind. And of course, it zapped me into the non-dual. And then I had to play catch up with my body. So it makes sense that the integration, the embodiment took a few years for me to, to drop that wisdom into how does it show up in the world? All right, put my body in situations that my monastic training, for want of a better word, would have avoided. Mm -hmm. You see, And it was Absolutely. really about bringing my body into it. And now my body, my body is a key player in informing me. I respect its wisdom. Sure. And the body is so great because noticing body sensations is something that can happen completely non-verbally and can only happen now. Yes. Yes. It's so always it's, present. Yeah. yeah. It's such a good window in. Yeah. 
I wanted to touch on a chapter in your book that was my favorite, very dear to my heart. It was so exciting in How to Be a Spiritual Rebel. It's the chapter on non-denialism. And, and the reason I find this exciting is I've been recently seeing something similar, although I didn't use the exact words, but I've seen so many people say, oh, that's not non-dual. Oh, that's not non-dual. What? And, and then it occurred to me that duality is included in non-duality. And people miss that. They and miss I, it. I'm not sure if that's what you're saying in non-denialism, but how would you put it? Yeah. Hey, there's an awful lot in that. I'm glad you brought this up. <laughs> um, in 2011, I think, I woke up one morning and I don't know if some of the listeners have the experience of something comes out your mouth and your brain is hearing it for the first time. Mm. And that that often happens to me. Not so much anymore, but it used to be a way that I would learn from, from my, the universe. Woke up this morning uh, in 2011 and was like, oh my God, identification with pure consciousness. The non-dual is identification with pure awareness. That's what it is. There's identification there. And the ground fell from under me where, where identification was seen through. It's like, oh, identification is the thing that is present in both. It's I can identify with the little self. And then we have this non-dual of I, am, I identify with pure awareness. That's what I am, my pure nature. And I identify with awareness. Oh, God, they're both caught bouncing off each other. So no wonder we're saying that's non-dual. That's dual. One is bad. One is good. Of course, they're playing tennis with each other. Uh -huh. They both are playing with a common ground of illusion. That identification can be right here and wrong here and wrong here and right here. So, so identification, if that dissolves, that whole concept dissolves, what happens then? And that brought me to a place of what I call non-denialism. Non it's like, I don't deny any of it. There is a non-dual lens of perception and I totally get it and I have ongoing access to it. And there's the dualistic lens of perception and I have ongoing access to it. And I don't stick to either. I don't mm -hmm. stick to either. They're both lens of perception. Is there deeper than the non-dual? Oh, you bet. And to go deeper than the non-dual, there has to be a capacity to say yes to both the non-dual and the dual. It's like both are held within the nothingness and everything. Mm -hmm. so, that, so, yeah, that's the territory we're talking about. Yeah, I love it. It's beautiful. Uh, and I can feel it when you talk about it, and but not in any real verbal way. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's so much fun. I'm wondering, Jack, if there's anything that we haven't asked you that you feel like has to come out or you would want to share that we haven't explored yet. I'm just letting there be silence here so mm -hmm. that so that uh, there's space for something to come up. So right now, what I did was stop my mind to see what wants to happen. And there was nothing. And then I, when I spoke, I, I was going into my human brain to see if the Jack personality has something. Mm -hmm. and, and both are silent. Mm -hmm. And I, I always do that. I, I think I always do that. I think that's a technique I'd like to add in there. My first call is is the emptiness. It's the emptiness. Right. Uh, and kind of getting out of the way to see what wants to happen. And and I I I, I won't override this Jack woman. And and does she have an agenda? And if she has an agenda, I'll honor it. Sometimes I have to check out to see, is that agenda a little bit sticky? 
And even if it's sticky, I know it's not me, but I'm responsible for her. There's no question that there's identification with her. But my God, she's love itself doing her darn best. You know, she's beautiful. Right. And and we 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 are all these parts because we are all of it. We are all of it. So so how do we love and care for these parts of ourselves? Can we let ourselves be friggin' enormous? Because that's what we are. And so that takes a certain courage. And we've got to come out of any cage of fear that we might have. It's a dissolving into the oneness that is all. It's like recognizing I am a part of the ecosystem and I am all of the ecosystem. And, and how do I relate to both at the same time? And it becomes very fluid. I had to learn how to do it and it felt like I was in compartments. Mm -hmm. And I think the non-dual created that way of thinking because the non-dual, it's not this, you know, the netty netty, the not this, I am that, I am not, I am not the personal I. There's lots of I am this and I'm not that. And that's very useful to to embody the non-dual, to really click into the place of where you're not identifying with the default mode network, with the, the part of your brain that says, this is me and this is who I am. That's very useful. And the expansion that goes deeper, that non-denialism where nothing is denied, do I have the capacity to say yes to all of it? Where is there a fear that's making me want to contract so that I can only identify with the peace, the dual, the non-dual, the me, myself, I, and the, the I am, I am, period. <laughs> so, so both of those can exist within a much wider space. Now, I can say that wider space is what I am. Actually, there is no anything of what I am. There isn't. I, 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 there isn't. That sentence is garbage, really. It exists within certain lenses of perception. And, and it's it's a game. And it's as false as anything else that's out there that's false. And so with this non-denial non -denial approach, you can go deeper than the non-dual. And then people say, what goes deeper than the non-dual? Like, what is it? The personal eye will kick up again. And it's like, actually, it doesn't. Or when identification is seen through, when existence itself is seen through, when you see through consciousness itself. Yeah, but what goes prior to consciousness except consciousness? It's like, yeah, that, that's an answer from the dualistic brain. That's an answer from there. Mm -hmm. Let the ground fall from under you. Let everything dissolve. Everything. Expect nothing to happen. Be that open and empty and know that you never were, that you never were. And somehow, um, so somehow in the absence of all of these compartments and perspectives, they all come back in, in their place. And you know that consciousness itself is a myth. You know that awakening itself is a myth. You know that the dual and the non-dual is a myth and there are no paradoxes and there's no mystery it just makes sense it just is in a way that is understood in a way that i can't even use words for wow <laughs> what a that, beautiful that, that might have been our guided meditation i was just riding those waves <laughs> no that was really something yeah. um uh, one question, you know, uh, that occurred to me, it was that um, you mentioned that at some point you were seeing dead people, uh, which is a pretty unusual experience. Uh, do you have a sense of what that was or what, you know, there's these people who, who are doing uh, mediums, you know, shows and things like that, and they seem to be getting real information What's going on there? Uh, are there spirits around us that were dead or, you know, living and now they're dead? Or uh, do you have any idea? Oh, yeah. It, it's all there. <laughs> Everything that can be imagined quite likely exists, really exists in some uh -huh. dimension, in some realm. Uh -huh. 
Absolutely. I did work as a medium as a while for a while. I did. Like, yeah. And, you know, I gave up all those skills. I actually had to surrender them. You know, my father, who's dead now, my father said once my third eye opened and I was like, my life was changing. And he said, you know, the media will put you in a box and they will love that you have these tools and skills now. Mm -hmm. Keep it to yourself. Do your work and don't market yourself in any way. And it's been like that largely. I'm mm -hmm. I'm actually really bad at, at marketing still. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I I I just never got on that train. Yeah. And and I'm so glad he said that because it didn't pigeonhole me. And it allowed me to like, okay, sure, there's dead people. And I have learned some tools to move them on. And I did. Mm. And I then started working on people who were living instead of people who were dead. And then I became a healer. And then, you know, it moved on from there. And then one day it's like, stop the whole thing. You're now just caught in this service. Stop the whole thing. What about your own growth? You're not growing anymore. You're just serving by rote. I'm like, okay, stop, stop the whole thing, stop. And and then the the stillness began, the real stillness. I was meditating a lot through all those years, but I had to disconnect from the outside world. Um, I then had to surrender those tools because at some point I was not sure how much of my identity is wrapped up in the fact that my third eye is very open and I can see chakras and I can see past lives. And I, I like how much... It, how, am I kidding myself? Like, mm -hmm. what about being ordinary, really ordinary? And I remember I was in India and I went onto the sacred mountain, Arunachala, where I was hanging out for a few years. And I did a ceremony and gave it all back. So take everything, mm -hmm. everything that makes me not ordinary, take it all and let my life be as 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 it can be directed by the divine within, not by any jack agenda or any currency that I am given because of the world we live in right now. I don't want any of it. I'm handing it all back and let ordinariness happen. And and the tools left me completely for several oh. years. Yeah. And they come in and in and out now every now and then. You know, if like when I'm doing the work, I'm I yeah, I'm like, whoops, I can see what's going on here, what's going on here. And so, you know, that makes it great fun. I, I, I can play in those dimensions when they show up. I, mm -hmm. I, I offer those tools when they show up, you know. Um, but there's no stickiness in it for me, it, you know. It's, yes. Yeah. I get it. Mm. It's fascinating. It's wonderful. Yeah. I have challenged um, another teacher friend of mine who works with guides, you know, and she said, I can't do my non-dual teaching without my guides. I can't. That's where it comes from. Mm. I'm like, but, what, don't you see that you'd really, really grow if you got rid of that attachment? And if you told them, OK, leave me be. And she goes, I, I, no, I couldn't do my work. Up came the fear. I couldn't support myself. I couldn't. I, I'd have to close down. And I said, yeah, and see where that would bring you. Oh, she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it either. I'm like, gosh, there we go. There we go. You know, our paths are different. Right. Yeah. And 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 if, if, wherever we're at, like the work she's doing with people is amazing. You know, and she will always have way more people following her than I will ever have. You know, but that's not my wiring. I have to honor what's right for me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people want to talk to their guides and they want that somebody to mediate between the other realms and them, you know? And, but for me, no, I, I can't. My own journey comes first and mm -hmm. I will serve secondary from, from honoring what's right for Jack. For me, it's the other way around. I, I'm just mm -hmm. wired differently. Well, what's what you're you're honoring what's right for you is something that I've always found very appealing and attractive in 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 you and what you write about and what you talk about. And I'm just so grateful that um, we get to share that with our listeners. Yeah. yeah. 
And I appreciate your courage because a lot of what you did, you know, in terms of the surrender and giving things up is a real good role model for for people on their own journey, because I'm sure some of those things were, were a challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been a, a rocky ride, but you know, I love it. Like, mm -hmm. I just love it. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, what else to do? You know, right. Like, it's <laughs> great fun. You know, fun is good. Fun is wonderful. Yep. It's wonderful. And it's, it's my, it's my barometer, you know, it's like, okay, so so there's a bit of friction with this person. All right, Jack, so where's the fun? And that leads me into curiosity and exploration and creativity. And and something says yes to all of it. All of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, I think that's why, you know, Jonathan and I resonate with that so much because we feel the same way. That's it, yeah. And this podcast is fun. You, you yeah. make it light and fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I just have to tell the listeners when I when we started this call and I got to see you guys on Zoom, I didn't know what you looked like. And I'm like, oh, my God, they're like my age. I thought they were kids because there's such vibrancy and youth and well done. It's beautiful to, to have that energy. You know, it's it, it's it comes as part of the spiritual process too. that freedom and fun and lightness and levity. It's a consequence, isn't it? Of, yeah. of, and of wonder and curiosity. Th yeah. Those are probably as important for staying young as taking care of your body and supplements and all those things, you know. You got it. Yeah. Yep. Totally agree. That's right. Totally agree with you. Yeah. Well, this has been amazing. Uh, normally, I don't like to take notes, but you kept on saying so many goddamn great things that I was writing things down during this entire thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Can I throw in one thing? Okay. Sure. My brain has come up with something. Um, I've mentioned a few different spiritual teachers there, and we're all on different paths. And a few years ago, I was involved in setting up an association for spiritual integrity to offer support to teachers. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to name it. Um, it's a slowly evolving organization, which makes it mm, possible for teachers to be more aware of themselves. How yeah. do I show up in the world to assist us to be accountable in our embodied phase, to assist us? Uh, tell me how to manage in the world. Do mm. I have enough tools and skills? Do, do I need training? Do I need support? Do I feel that there's nobody I can talk to? And very often spiritual teachers feel that there's nobody they can talk to. And so the Association for Spiritual Integrity is for spiritual leaders to speak to each other. Mm. And so just to say that that's out there. Very young idea. organization. Yeah. And if people want, if a teacher hears this and wants to know more about that, how would they find that information? Spiritual-integrity.org. Okay. And, and how about uh, if they want more information about you, what's the best place for them to go? Uh, jack okeefecom Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is Rick Archer involved in the spiritual integrity thing? Yeah. He is. Yeah. He is. I think it's a really important service because you know all the all the uh, you know scandals around teachers turn people off, whereas you know people can really benefit from a good teacher. Yes. Yeah, and and you know what we've done so far has helped hugely hugely to to mediate between teachers and students to recognize that some teachers actually don't want to change at all mm -hmm. and that most do they want to be better at what they do mm -hmm. and we're changing the culture because traditionally you know you have the spiritual teacher like the priest and the rabbi like god incarnate mm -hmm. you know who's up on that pedestal and it's like um that's that's a model that doesn't work for us anymore, where there is fear against the authority. It's like, right. uh, could, could we do this in a more inclusive way? You know, there's the inclusive word again, to where the humanness of the teacher is, is um, given space mm -hmm. and support. And as a result, the student can grow then because the agency and autonomy of the student is honored. And we want to do that. 
so that the, the student is allowed to, this doesn't feel right. And how can I tell the teacher that this doesn't feel like it's okay? Mm -hmm. Can we have systems of feedback that become normal between student and teachers? So many things for us to do. Yeah, so important, so important. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been such a treat, Jack. I, I uh, haven't read your books. Uh, now I think I am. And uh, I just got so much personally from this. So I'm really grateful. Oh, listen, the fun was all mine. Yeah, yeah. Really, it's just a hoot. Yeah, it's great fun to just have a, a space to throw my hands around and, you know, <laughs> and, and express and yeah. let it all happen, you know. So thank you, guys. Sure. Well, now we know what it's like to be a spiritual rebel. Yeah. But not, but not as an identity. <laughs> no, it's a game. It's a right. beautiful game. A beautiful yeah. game. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And what we are is, is good with all of it, with all of it, however it shows up. There really, really is no right and wrong, really, you know. So I just want to mention to our friends that, that get stuff from this, that feel free to support us on Patreon, uh, Awareness Explorer, no, patreon.com forward slash Awareness Explorers, where we send you a bunch of additional stuff uh, for that support. And um, you were going to say something, Brian. Just that I'm very grateful to you, and I can't wait for our listeners to hear this episode. So Me thank too. you so much, Jack. Yeah, yeah thank you no. both. Thank you to our listeners. And whatever is happening now for the listeners, you know, see what's going on in your body. Mm. See what's going on in your body. Don't judge it. Let it be there. Yeah. And, and it will move, and another experience will come in. Mm-hmm. That's probably the, now, the most wise and, and simplest guided meditation. Yeah. <laughs> Just let it be there without mm -hmm. any judgment at all. Let it be there. The experience will move on then. See, it is judgment is the thing that will make it stick. Let mm -hmm. the experience move on and another one will come and be there with that too. Mm -hmm. Right. Beautiful. Let it be simple. Until next time, keep exploring. Keep exploring. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more, you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. We'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends, because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.